Microcontrollers have begun to rival early PCs and retro gaming consoles in measures like speed and memory, and even leapfrog them with new capabilities like multiple cores and wireless connectivity. One area that still seems to be lacking a bit is video. Sure, you can connect a smallish LCD via I2C or I2C if you prefer, or SPI, and that's normal, but can these little marvels do more? With a little spicier circuit, I think so. And in fact, we know so. Ren6991 successfully bit-banged DVI, the RP2040, and validated the output up to 372 megabits per second, which is good enough for HD 720 at 30 hertz. That leaves some resolution milestones unexplored, however. For example, full HD, that's 1920 by 1080, and specifically at 60 hertz, aka 1080p, times 24-bit color depth, which is 8 bits each for the red to green and blue subpixels, also known as RGB888, is over 2.9 gigabits per second, not including control signals and blanking overhead, approaching an order of magnitude larger. Back to Ren 6991, the CPU cycles for QVGA, that's 320 by 240, consumes around 30% of its total processing power. So that means there's only headroom to about triple the processing rate. Maybe with a very aggressive overclock, it could get into the ballpark, but it seemed like considering we have up to 30 GPIO pins to play with and DVI's Transition Minimized Differential Signaling, or TMDS encoding, uses only 6 pins, there had to be a way of using the 32-bit width to help escape the bottleneck. The RP2040's M0 Plus course can execute one 32-bit move instruction in one clock cycle which means that if all the 30 GPIO pins were tasked with sending this output, the theoretical maximum throughput from an ideal one core, one IPC times 30 pin times 133 megahertz normal clock speed is around 3.99 gigabits per second. Although GPIOs are needed for other functions and some processing is necessary to work out what to send. And also it's important to note that only 26 GPIO pins are exposed in the Raspberry Pi Pico. I considered an overclock and a gigahertz speed capable shift register, specifically the very interesting MC100 EP142FA. I also considered a reduced color bit depth like RGB565 or RGB666. Ultimately, it seemed like an RGB to HDMI encoder would be the best idea to offload the encoding functions, and one can be had cheaper than the ultra-fast shift registers. Another problem, with only 260 kilobytes of RAM on board, how could the RP2040 store even a single frame that's 1920 by 1080 by 24 bits per pixel, which is more than 49 megabits per frame? Divided by 8 bits per byte, it works out to 6.22 megabytes. Display protocols require that the frame be transmitted many times per second. Clearly the RP2040 needs another IC in the mix, external RAM, and specifically larger than 49 megabits. With this, the RP2040 could store the entire desired output for the current frame at all times, which frees the RP2040 from having to forget and then redraw sections of each frame. It only has to deal with pixels that need to be updated, and it can write those updates into memory over time, sending the current state of the frame in memory each time the video protocol needs a frame. The best part about an independent memory chip is that the RP2040 doesn't necessarily need the data returned to it. Supposing the use case doesn't require acting upon the existing frame, but simply overwriting it. The RP2040 only needs to send the RAM the address of the next batch of pixels, which the RAM can then make available to the HDMI encoder transmitter between their respective outputs and inputs. When considering different RAM module options, static RAM or SRAM, would have the least timing hassles, but because they're often 16 or 8-bit and were exclusively so from JLC PCB at the time of working out the circuit, although note that 24-bit options were available at DigiKey, you'd probably need multiple RAM banks to alternate between to keep your reads continuous and have time to write. Dynamic RAM, DRAM, or SDRAM has more timing overhead considering the refreshes that it requires, but there are some inexpensive options in the right size, speed, and 
and bit width for such a frame buffer. A RAM IC with full page burst read capability can also spare you a lot of address transmissions and let you do some other things during those clock cycles, like prepare the next address or the next chunk of data to be written into the frame buffer. I originally set the address info to be transmitted by a binary counter, but ultimately went with shift registers for more control from the software. So, finding desktop resolution video output theoretically possible, I put together an RP2040 desktop board, complete with Ethernet, USB-C in with real, that is negotiated power, not requiring a USB-A to C cable or using any resistor hacks, a blingy gold sync board HDMI output with video and sound, and I2S audio also piped to an onboard speaker, as well as a microphone input two USB A's for mouse and keyboard, headphone jack, and hardware cutoff switches for mic and speaker, as well as compatibility and quality of life options. Perhaps a good dev kit if you want to build on free RTOS, Zephyr, etc. By the way, I love the maniac that made PyDOS for the RP2040. Link in the description, and you should definitely watch his videos. However, that original board is pricey at $40 per unit via JLC PCB. I scaled that back to just the proof of concept stuff, a cheaper USB setup with the USB A to C cable requirement, no sync board connectors, no speaker or microphone, and no configuration switches. And this cut the build cost about in half. So if you had the hardware in hand and you're trying to address external RAM via the RP2040, what would that RAM addressing look like? With multiple RAM ICs, supposing your frame buffer has pages of 512 bits, that means with 49 megabits per frame divided by 512 bits per page times three parallel 8-bit colors width, that's 32,400 pages to address divided by two ranks if you were swapping between two banks of either two 16-bit or three 8-bit SRAMs, which is perhaps not ideal because using chip select to deselect ranks means a chip will not listen for writes when it's not being read. It gets complicated when there are multiple ICs trying to talk on the same line. Works out to 16,200 row addresses needed. Supposing it was all in one bank, you could just tie your bank select pins either high or low. Therefore, address space bits needed are 2 to the 14th, advancing plus 1 for every 512 clock ticks. And double checking our math, 16,200 addresses times 512 bits times three parallel colors in the high and low bits of the wider bit width RAM ICs or on multiple independent 8-bit ICs times two ranks equals the same 49.7664 megabits we've worked out before. Check your data sheet for your bank, row, and column arrangement and addressing requirements. For control, you'll need at least row address strobe, column address strobe, and write enable connected between your microcontroller and your RAM. You might be able to get away with tying chip select and clock enable to the values that keep the chip on, especially if you're only using rank of one, i.e. you're swapping between banks within the same single chip, not between different sets of chips. And in this case, if you're using DRAM, you'll want to wire up your microcontroller to output to bank address pins. And whichever upper address bit, often A10, is used for setting auto precharge. For the shift registers used for writes to RAM, i.e. the data, in addition to serial data in and between registers where you pipe the output of one to the input of the next, you'll want to control their clocks, reset, and output enable to set their output so they're not outputting their values on the same line the HDMI encoder is supposed to be reading from. Or you can limit your writes to the HDMI blanking intervals where the data input enable pin of the HDMI is set to ignore inputs anyway. As mentioned, SDRAM timing. For example, starting up might require a timed pause, triggering the data mask, pre-charging all banks, and running several eight or so auto refresh cycles. During operation, you'll have to pay attention to some other timing details. For example, if your max bank active time is 100,000 nanoseconds, you might hit a limit of 32 column reads per bank activation. And then some time in the low single digits as a percentage is lost to refreshing. Check your data sheet for the refresh timings to work out the overhead required if the frequencies you have to hit for your use case are very close to the RAM frequencies. For example, some HDMI encoders operate at 165 MHz and many SD RAMs operate at 166 MHz. 
So what does everyone think? Maybe something like this would be of interest to retro gamers wanting to plug their RP2040 based emulator into a TV or monitor. Maybe piping a terminal to modern displays. As mentioned, PyDOS is interesting. Thinking about a graphical user interface, the most feature complete one for microcontrollers I see out there is FabGL, but that's for ESP32. If you're after 1024 by 768 at 60 frames per second or smaller resolutions, going bigger with an all-winter V3S or similar that has RAM inside the package and outputs RGB888 might be a more straightforward option. For digital signage, a low-end orange banana mango insert tropical fruit here rock pie reds a zero variant would be about the same price and would be validated so i'm not sure i see a ton of potential for users in this device sometimes it's just fun to explore the limits i'm putting the board schematics and pcb files out there I'll see the links in the description if you do use these please double check everything as i have not had these built and therefore have not had a chance to test them